Okay, before I recognize the student, I, uh, and I'll just ask the, the, the lady that's accompanying the students to um, choose whether she stands in, in place or um, comes down with them, but uh, is Miss Angel um, Wilson. Uh, she's health educator consultant, SWAT coordinator, tobacco prevention and control program, um, health education and promotion within the state of Florida Department um, of Health. Ms. Wilson, would you please stand? Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, I'd like to call uh, Mr. Thomas Bacon, uh, junior at Pine Forest High School and member of the Students Working Against Tobacco to make presentation to City Council on the harmful effects of tobacco use. Mr. Bacon, would you join us down here, please? Yes, sir. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor Hayward and Pensacola City Council members. I come to you today as a member of the Skemby County Students Working Against Tobacco Group to ask you to adopt a resolution. Uh, I'm sorry, but we have some uh, facsimile uh, forms with uh, information. Sorry, I didn't mean to start so mm -hmm. early. Mm -hmm. okay. if, if you give them to the clerk, please. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Shall I continue? Sure. <clears throat> Uh, I come to you today as a member of the Students Working Against Tobacco Group to ask you to adopt a resolution urging retailers to stop selling candy flavored tobacco in the Scambia County and Petscola. 90% of smokers begin using tobacco before the age of 19. In fact, and I quote, today's teenagers, tomorrow's potential regular customer, and the overwhelming majority of smokers first begin to smoke while they're still in their teens. The smoking patterns of teenagers are particularly important to Philip Morris. This quote from Philip Morris displays how tobacco companies feel about encouraging the use of this deadly product. Tobacco attracts 4,000 youths every day in the U.S. and each year kills over 5 million people worldwide. The newest tobacco company tactic comes in the form of candy flavored tobacco. Tobacco companies are targeting youth by having their products look and taste like candy. Tobacco orbs look like Tic Tacs. Snus looks like small tea bags, and strips look like Listerine strips. Flavors such as grape cherry, watermelon, cotton candy, icy mint, and peach are added to the product to mask the harsh taste found in cigars, cigarillos, spit tobacco, and chew, and dissolvable products. Candy flavored tobacco targets new users, of which the major majority are youth. Studies show that 17-year-old smokers are three times more likely to use flavored tobacco products than smokers who are over the age of 25. Youth tobacco is a problem in our county and country. According to the data from 2010 Florida Youth Tobacco Survey, 9.7% of Escambia County middle school youth reported using one or more tobacco products in 30 days. This is above average compared to the state rate of 8.7%, even more shocking that 24.6% of Escambia County high school youth have admitted that they have used tobacco in the past 30 days, which is above the state average of 22.2%. In a small random sample of Escambia County youth in 2010, the FYTS found 871 middle school students tobacco, were tobacco users and 2,881 high school users were there. That is 3,752 youth tobacco users in just a small sample of uh, Escambia County. The, the tobacco industry advertises to youth at an early age. We are conditioned to view candy as a, something that is a treat for youth. In psychology, we call this the token economy because our peers, teachers, and parents, and coaches award us with candy for our good behavior and deeds. The tobacco candy is like saying that it's okay for our youth, including myself, my peers, to use it. There's nothing safe about these products. They use flavoring and color, coloring to entice us. They hook us into a trap of addiction. These candy flavored products are like any other tobacco products. They addict, manipulate, destroy, and kill young people like myself. Today we are asking you to take a stand and help save the lives of thousands of youth by adopting a candy flavored tobacco resolution, urging retailers not to sell candy flavored tobacco in the, prod in the city of Pensacola. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you, Mr. Becky. No, don't leave yet because you yes, may sir. have some comments or yes, questions sir. from uh, um, city council. 
Um, I would just like to invite you back. I don't see any problem with us adopting a resolution like this. It, it may be a couple of meetings away from now. Yes, sir. But uh, would you be willing to come back down here um, if and when that happens? Uh, absolutely, sir, if I have no prior engagements. Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, I try won't interfere with prom or graduation or anything, oh. <laughs> anything like that. Okay. Well, great. And we could even put it off, you know, work around um, your schedule. But uh, have you and your group and and, yes, and Ms. Davis uh, come come back. Um, do have a couple of people that wanted to speak, uh, Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President. And I wanted to thank uh, you and your group for coming down and also putting together this packet for us. A great deal of information is in here, and I know it took a long time to get this together. Yes, ma'am. And a lot of times our being able to take action takes us being able to find this information. Yeah. And I do see that the Board of County Commissioners passed a resolution in 2011. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So us and then you've given us some wording as well, so it should be pretty easy to follow up. And um, this is quite disturbing to know that this is being sold to kids in our community. I mean, there's another issue out there with something called spice or bath salts, and that's yes, now become a felony in the state of Florida. Um, so, you know, I don't know what regulation the state will be doing, but I look forward to hearing more information from our staff and seeing it again. So thank you for all your hard work. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Spencer. Yes, thank you for this um, awareness campaign that you provided. I suggest that you also contact our local American Heart Association. They have been active in sending represent representatives to Tallahassee, um, particularly to address this issue. So I think you would be um, armed with additional support with um, information as well as copies of letters that they have um, already written um, regarding this on a state legislative level. All right, thank you very All much, right. Cheryl. And Definitely get the information. They'll be thrilled to have you as a soldier. Mr. President? Yes. I hate to interrupt. May I go back and make a motion? I've been asked by the administrator that that would be a better way of handling this since okay. we're interested in doing that. So okay. I'll actually make a motion in support of this. So um, I'd like to make a motion that the City Council um, uh, request that staff uh, craft a resolution for, um, uh, should I read this into the record, urging tobacco retailers to stop the sale and marketing in the city of Pensacola of candy flavored tobacco products not covered by the FDA. Second. Second. Okay, there is a motion and a second, um, and uh, we can get to the, the other comments uh, um, people later. I would just like to have us go ahead and vote on this. And that passes unanimously. So we'll, we'll be in touch with you on that. Uh, Ms. Ms. Myers. Um, I just wanted to thank you for coming down here and bringing this to uh, our attention. <laughs> it's a subject that I feel very strongly about. And I'm not prejudiced. I used to be a smoker. And I know how pleasurable smoking is and how addictive <laughs> it is. And um, I uh, just uh, am very proud of you for caring enough about other people to uh, share the knowledge and information you have concerning these very dangerous, this very dangerous product. And uh, actually, when I was growing up, we had little candy cigarettes. You could, I mean, they weren't real cigarettes. They were candy that looked like cigarettes. And you know, I was six, seven years old. We thought it was really cool to, you know, eat candy uh, shaped cigarettes. So. Uh, I'm very proud of you for spreading the message and doing the hard work to get it out. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gerald. Thank you, Mr. President. And briefly, young man, I'd like to thank you for coming down to come before us with this issue. And I, I, as a former educator and a former respiratory therapist, it would be important to include the American Lung Association in your research if you have not already done so. I've treated thousands of individuals with pulmonary lung diseases over a 32-year period. So I know a lot about life support and uh, the injuries that cigarette smoking, and particularly if it's introduced to children at an early age, it has the potential for a long-term uh, problem once they're convinced that that's something that they think that it's cool to do. But, you know, think, thanks again, and I always get excited when I see students come before us that are 
uh, still in high school and beginning to develop an understanding of what it means to move forward uh, as a leader and to have an opinion that you're willing to share, express, and to support. So thanks for being here. Okay, thanks. Okay. Well, thank, thank you for your time. Thank you. And would you like to have your other group stand up and be recognized? You can call them out by name if you wish. Uh, just, there's a, I'm just going to say that uh, uh, it's real been help with the uh, uh, Scambia County uh, SWAT coordinator. She's been instrumental in all the work that we've done. She's come out to the local high schools, not just my high school, but all the uh, high schools in the Scambia County, and just trying to get as much support for the cause as possible. Uh, we've got people from multiple schools from Pine Forest and uh, the other schools. But just without them, it wouldn't be possible to do it. And uh, I'd like to thank them personally. Okay, well, well thank you. And Ms. Wilson, I hope you and your group will be able to come back down when we have this on the agenda. Th thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, I've got things out of order here. I'm not off to, to a good start. I was supposed to be doing the open forum first, but we're going to get to that. We're still going to give you a I'm your open forum, but since I'm already on this tack, um, I want to just go ahead and finish with the, the presentation. Is that okay with you? Okay, good. I thought so. <laughs> All right. All right. Recognition of Adrian Stills, Director of Golf Operations. And normally we let the Executive Department um, um, read this. And I'd like to have Ms. Stills come on down, but I, um, I feel like I, this is something I wanted to read this time. Um, Mr. Still has uh, been inducted into the Black Professional Golfers Hall of Fame. Is that right, sir? Yes, sir. I, I was. Okay. <laughs> Let me just uh, give give um, some highlights of uh, Mr. Still's um, life. His father introduced him to golf at a young age as a way of staying out of trouble, but also as a bonding avenue with his sons. He's a two-time All-American at South Carolina State University. He's won three North Florida PGA section championships, won 20 Florida mini tour events, competed in two U.S. Open championships, played in the PGA Tour in 86 and 87, inducted into the Mid-Eastern Atlantic Conference Hall of Fame in 1993, taught at Grand Cypress Academy of Golf in Orlando for 15 years. He moved to Pensacola to help organize the first tee of Northwest Florida, an advocacy organization committed to promoting character development and life-enhancing values of children through the game of golf. Until 2010, Stills was the last black golfer in 25 years to qualify for the PGA Tour through the PGA Tour qualifying tournament. He's a member of a group of black business professionals who founded a mini tour where the top performing player each year receives a paid entry and other expense fees into the PGA qualifying tournament. He's the director of golf operations and head pro at the city-owned Osceola Golf Course. On March 10th, 22, he was inducted into the National Black Golf Hall of Fame in Tampa. And Mr. Sills, if you would come up here, or I have have something that I'd, I'd like to pr present to you on Thank behalf you. of the city. This is from the, the sports page on that date, and uh, we wanted you to, to, to have this. So on behalf of Mayor Hayward and the city council and the, all the employees, you have our, our thanks and congratulations, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. This is awesome. Um, thank you very much, Council, um, City of Pensacola. Uh, it's a great honor to be a, a member of the uh, National Black Golfers Hall of Fame, and it's an honor to be back in the community I grew up on or grew up in, and uh, being a part of uh, Osceola Golf Course. So. Uh, this is a great honor, and I, I thank you very much. Thank you, um, Mr. President. While you were reading all the attributes of uh, uh, Adrian, Mr. Steeles, 
he failed to mention that he beat me out of ten dollars <laughs> and uh, it caused me some real pain because at the time I didn't know he could play that good so I think uh, that was the triggering point for him to go on to excel <laughs> when, uh, when he beat me thank oh, you yeah. so very much it was a great honor concert I think I think everybody would love to shake your hand yeah, you. okay Spencer, uh, I believe you have an announcement presentation to make. Yes. Okay. I don't know if we have a plaque, Mr. President. I do not. Okay. But what we will do is ask two individuals to to come up here and may, may yes. I? All right. Absolutely. For those of you that have uh, attended previous council meetings and fellow council members, you recall that we had two volunteers from the Pensacola running community, Pat Cosmos and John Clark, it's nice to see the plaque, um, who initiated a process that involved months of hard work that would hopefully result, and tonight I'm pleased to say that their efforts were not fruitless. and. Their goal was to provide Pensacola a designation as one of our countries, one of America's runner-friendly communities, a designation that is awarded by the Road Runners Club of America. And I want to remind everyone that running is becoming increasingly popular. It's one of the most affordable sports. Um, that we have and serves as the really the base of many of our other community supported sports activities such as soccer, football, baseball, etc. It all involves running. So tonight um, we are fortunate to have the official announcement that Pensacola is now a runner friendly community and I'd like to recognize Pat Cosmos and John Clark, if you'd please step up here and um, you can speak as well to, to share with mm -hmm. others what was involved to get this <laughs> designation. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Nice seeing you. Um, it, was, it was a, a very long process. Um, there are several facets that were involved with this. Um, it's not just an individual. It's a, it's a business support um, community, businesses that promote or encourage the running community that will um, hold functions for, um, um, for the runners, uh, facilities like McGuire's or, or Seville Quarter, Captain Funds, that will hold weekly runs uh, for the area runners and also provide large events, um, the uh, St. Patrick's Day run for McGuire's that brought in record numbers this year, and Seville Quarter that does their, uh, their yearly uh, turkey trot. Um, other businesses that encourage or support the runners, uh, Bagel Heads, Starbucks, places like that. Um, we have a, uh, an actually uh, a top 50 uh, runner business in Pensacola with Running Wild. They, they won that distinction last year. Um, that's out of the United States. So this is, this is here in Pensacola that we have this community uh, or we have this business. We have other businesses that are supporting not only running um, but the, the triathlon community with uh, multi-sport um, uh, fitness. Um, we also have, with great support, the, the city 
that uh, works with the running community, that has members that work specifically with, with us, helping us with routes, with dates, with security, um, the, the uh, Pensacola Police Department that will uh, man the, the heavily traveled intersections. And I've, I've run all over the United States and I, I can tell you I've run in some areas where there's no police protection out there. Uh, we support you guys. We thank you for being out there. Um, and you know, the, um, uh, Mayor Hayward wrote a, uh, a proclamation for us um, that we'll have uh, uh, posted as well. Um, and you know, through the through the efforts of the city, um, and, and I, I would like to to mention, and I'm off track, obviously, um, but I, I would like to, to thank some some members. Obviously, Councilman Brian Spencer, who was who was instrumental in pointing us in the right direction who to contact. Uh, Ms. Deweese, who, who listened to me at, at church, uh, and, I, and I cornered her at our, our children's running events and field day, um, and, and also city staff who were very, very instrumental. Uh, Ms. Kim, Kim Kaminsky uh, with the special events coordinator, Jeff Pullman, and uh, David Flaherty uh, with Parks and Recreation without their help. Um, this wasn't. This wouldn't be. Um, this wouldn't wouldn't be possible. So, it was a community um, project. It wasn't just the the, the Pensacola Runners Association. So, um, um, I guess I'll I'll stop at that point. So, um, you know what and, and what I have to say in, in closing. Um, I'd like to you know I'd like to say that our, our fellow PRA board members. Um, we are a passionate group. Uh, we live in Pensacola, we raise our families here, and we love to play here. Um, we are here to assist the city uh, in promoting Pensacola in, uh, in any way possible. We're here to help, so please call on us. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And, Mr. President, I had the, uh, the plaque issue a little bit um, confused. Actually, the plaque is being presented from them to the city of Pensacola, and I will allow you to no, receive sir, that. I, I would wish you would as our, our designated right. runner here. So, and I'll say something real quick if I can. Yes. Well, first we'd like to present this to you guys because um, you know Pat came to the board with this idea, and our take on it was run with it, which he did flawlessly. But we couldn't have done this at all without the city's help, and the city has always been extremely helpful with all of our events that, that we do here and, and I, you know we can't thank you enough for that so we want to actually present you guys with this plaque in addition we've made some additional uh, enhancements with our relationship with the Pensacola Sports Association and there will also be a plaque just like this as well as a proclamation letter on display uh, in their offices at all times so hopefully this is a, a good step in uh, what I've been wearing out council and Spencer about for before his run for office that we need to make this a pedestrian friendly city and this I think is a great step towards uh, doing that by bringing awareness to it so thank you all well, thank, thank you thank Ms. you please Ms. Mr. Weiss wanted to make some remarks <clears throat> yes thank you just very quickly I wanted to share a story that your hard work has already began to pay off I know that your passion is runners and wanting to make sure that the rest of the country or even the whole world knows about us and um, I have a family member that is an Ironman athlete, and before he came to visit a couple weeks ago, I mentioned that we have this designation now, mentioned all of your hard work, and when he left, I said, did it feel different? And he said, yes, I think simply by knowing that there are runners in the community and that the community is committed to it, it feels like a better place to be and train and, and be part of whatever else is going on in the community. So I, I'm proud of your efforts, and this is something that shows how we can change our community by a small group of passionate people getting this designation and then being able to share that with others. So I congratulate you. Thank you. Pat, John, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. BS 10K, May 5th. <laughs> Don't come out. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, Brian. Mr. Johnson, you um, had some remarks you wanted to make about the recent um, event. Um, out at Roger Scott. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, 
we uh, uh, had the uh, Pensacola open, the wheelchair open, uh, had a uh, hundred and uh, hundred plus players out there representing uh, many countries uh, from all over uh, the world. Um, had uh, the top, many of the top wheelchair players uh, in the world here that participated in the event. It was a tremendous success. Um, this council, I want to thank them and the mayor and the mayor's staff for their support of this event. Um, it was again a, a tr tremendous success, and uh, without uh, everyone's cooperation, it wouldn't be. Wouldn't be the uh, person uh, I'd like to also single out would be Doc, uh, Mr. Uh, David Mayo. Uh, Mr. Mayo uh, is the he head of this uh, event and uh, does a great job every year. Um, it showcases Pensacola and. Uh, uh, um, how friendly of a community we are, and uh, and I think it uh, reaches others uh, out all over the world. So I want to thank everyone for their support and cooperation, Mr. Flaherty and uh, Mr. Bruce Caton also. So thank you. It was a tremendous success. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now perhaps I can get us back on on track. My apologies. Uh, um, we're going to move into the um, open forum section. Mr. Alistair McKenzie is first up. Evening Council, how are you doing this evening? My name is Alistair McKenzie. I'm here to talk about chickens, actually. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you saw the story this week, um, but there's an organic <coughs> farmer that lives over in East Hill that has had a code enforcement violation put against him because he's had chickens in his backyards that don't comply with the ordinance. Uh, I went and looked these ordinances up. They're 4-2-2 to 4-2-5. They were passed in 1968. Who knows if they've ever been enforced before. Um, the reason I want to talk to you about it is to kind of get it on you guys' radar and hopefully, you know, seek some, I, I guess, at, at the least alterations or edits to this ordinance. Um, I, I myself am a backyard gardener and plan to have chickens in my backyard as well. Um, I don't think I need to go into, like, the whole organic revolution and everything else that's going on. Um, part of that is a lot of people are getting involved these days with uh, growing their own food and raising their own, you know, you know, small livestock in their backyards like chickens and bees and making honey and things like that. Uh, apparently, you know, it's it's really healthy. It's really good for you. You can know the source of your food and where it comes from. Even today, there was an article in the New York Times about how bad, like, farm factory eggs are, uh, you know, and how nutritionally valueless they are compared to the, you know, eggs that come from your backyard. Um, the way the law sits right now is that it requires uh, the chickens or any fowl of any kind to be in an enclosure 50 feet away from any structure. And in the city of Pensacola, that's pretty much impossible, you know. Um, so I, I really think that, you know, I, there, this gentleman I know is, I, I don't know him personally, but I know about at least a dozen people, at least in the East Hill area, that have chickens in their backyard. And, you know, they're not causing any problems. They're not causing any health concerns. And so I really wish that council would revisit it because I think, you know, it's, it's really a, a healthy thing for people to have their own fresh eggs. And they're also pets too as well. So, you know, if you would start taking a look at that, you know, and maybe make some alterations or edits to it, you know, given the nature of the changing times and people wanting to raise their own food, I think it would be a good thing. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you. Just stay there, please. Ms. Myers. Uh, could you give me the side of the ordinance it's again? There's 4-2-2. Wait just a minute. Don't talk too fast now. I'm a southerner, and I <laughs> <laughs> talk, talk my language. Yes, okay. yes ma'am. It's 4-2-2 okay. to 4-2-5. Okay. Okay. I, I do want to, to revisit that uh, ordinance. Uh, because um, factory farming is extremely cruel. So when I buy eggs, I buy uh, free roaming hen eggs. Not that the eggs are free roaming, but the hens are. <laughs> I just want to clarify that. But, um, you know, I, I would like to make it easier for people to be able to to have chickens and like you said they also make good pets i've had chickens for pets so i'm, I'm going to uh, to look at this and i would love to talk to you some more about it so maybe we can communicate uh, absolutely ag again yeah. about this thank you okay thank you sir thank, thank you, you miss myers uh, mr clifford stokes and my apologies to making you have to have to wait through the presentations no problem i'm here in a way uh, Clifford Stokes, 7480 Rolling Hill Road. I live in the county, but I own property in the city. Uh, I have two issues that I like to talk about. First issue is contracting. 
it appears to me, at looking at some of these contracts, that we give contracts to the same people over and over again. Somehow we need a rotation or somehow spread this out for more people who are qualified can get on some of these contracts. Uh, it just doesn't seem fair that if you get to know somebody, you get the contract over and over again. So the city needs to look at somehow spreading these contracts among our among competitors to make it fair and balanced. It's not who you know, it's can you do the job properly. My second concern breaks into two groups and it's all on the diversity. I look at the city now and I don't see any diversity in our top managers. I see one top manager who is black female and I see a few more black females. I don't see any male blacks and I don't see any blacks help run in this city. 20% of this city are minorities. But we don't run this city. We don't make decisions in this city. It need to be some changes. You know, we need to have diversity in city management. We need people of color. This city is very diverse. We get other minorities in. We have other minorities in. We need diversity in running our city. We need different points of view in running our city. So that needs to change. I was present at one of the meetings where we had the Chamber of Commerce in. I didn't see any blacks in that group. I know we can't tell the Chamber of Commerce to hire, but we give them our money. They take our money. So somehow we need to influence the Chamber of Commerce in the hiring blacks so we can get some perspectives from our black community, from our Hispanic community. We need perspective from other people to help draw other people in here. And I look at the head of the Chamber of Commerce who tell people to come here and live and, and, and work and bring jobs here, but he doesn't even live in Pensacola or Samia County. How can you tell me to come here when you don't even want to live here? We need to look at these areas and come <clears throat> together and make some changes. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Stokes, Mr. Townsend has, either has remarks or a question for you. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank you uh, so much for bringing these issues uh, forward. These are some critical things that you brought forth, and I would hope that all who heard it will take heed, and hopefully we can uh, do something about it. Specifically in the, in the contract area, uh, we really need to ensure that all of the contracts are being awarded on a competitive basis and ensure that folks get a piece of the pie. On the diversity issue, that's been an issue that uh, some of us have been talking about constantly since we've been on, on the uh, council, and uh, we don't seem to be making any strides on that of any significant degree. Uh, it's strange that, well, not strange, because it was obvious that uh, what went down at the uh, committee of the whole meeting regarding the chamber's presentation, and we looked at it, and, and I had heard comments that uh, the makeup and the composition of that group that came in talking about the things that they were doing. Uh, and it, it was a void there. Uh, and I had some strong concern about it. I did not say anything at the time, but uh, there is, that is an issue that uh, should be dealt with in as much as you stated correctly about uh, the money, it's your money that going and we paying for their efforts so uh, we shall ensure that uh, some of the all of the folks get a piece of that as salary etc uh, you can look at the uh, welcome group if you go to ribbon cutting groups of the chamber you do not see any significant change uh, identical to what we saw monday so i really appreciate what what you brought forth thanks so much okay M mr Gerald. thank you mr president and uh mr stokes i want to personally thank you for being with us this evening and I would address both of your concerns. The first one uh, deals with um, repeatedly awarding contracts and, and so forth to individuals who have been getting them from since the beginning of time. Uh, as a matter of fact, on the pre-disparity study that MGT performed, one of the recommendations that they uh, forwarded back to the city of Pensacola was to begin a process of uh, bitter rotation rotating those individuals on the on the list that have been there for life uh, to
to rotate it and give others who, as you indicated, are qualified to do certain things an opportunity to demonstrate their, their skills and expertise. And that was completely uh, ignored as a recommendation from MGT. And I hope that with the full disparity study that such recommendations will be addressed and at least put into place. Uh, the second interest, uh, idea, I mean, uh, comment that you had involves uh, diversity of staffing, uh, not just here at the city of Pensacola, but basically throughout the city of Pensacola. And I'm one of those people who did observe what happened on Monday at the Committee of the Whole, and I made my remarks. I let it be known how I felt about it because I believe we were all looking at the same thing. And it appears to me that diversity and inclusion are a couple of terms that we like to use when it's convenient to talk about those kinds of things, I guess, as a soothing technique. But uh, as you have indicated, the city of Pensacola has a long way to go. What I strongly encourage and will continue to encourage that our citizens, like yourself, take the time to come down here and see what you saw on Monday. It's difficult to make a decision if you don't know what's really going on. And it's dependent on our folks to get together to take a personal interest in where their tax dollars are going and what they are being used for and to pay more attention and really to make demands. I mean, it's, it's, we're at the point now where I'm tired of talking about it, really. We've, I've been talking about it for 65 years, at least. And I've been seeing the same old repeated behavior. And I'm tired of talking about it. I'm sick of talking about it. We can talk about it in, in certain other groups. But it's time for the people to step up and demand what uh, a fair share of what they're putting into, into the pot. And once again, thank you so much for being here. Thank yes, you, Mr. President. Yes, thank you, sir. OK, I have no other cards before me, so I uh, move the approval of the minutes. They've been sent out to you ahead of time. Hope you had a chance to review them. Are there any um, additions, um, modifications, additions? Okay. Second. second. Got a motion and a second. Please vote. Mr. Johnson. Johnson. Pay attention. Okay, that passes unanimously. All right, thank you. <laughs> Madam Clerk, item number six. Okay. Item number six is a request to consider Request for Zoning and Future Land Use Map Amendment 4751, 4761, and 4771 North 9th Avenue and 126 Springdale Circle. Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Don Kelly is here to address this. Thank you. Members of Council, good evening. <clears throat> this is a rezoning request for both the zoning map and also the future land use map to amend four parcels of property located on 9th Avenue and one parcel is located 126 Springdale. That parcel on Springdale is also owned by the same property owner on 9th Avenue right in front of it and will most likely be developed as one single parcel because of its size. The request is precipitated by the purchaser of the property to the extreme south, 4751 North 9th Avenue. He purchased it from out of town with the intention of putting a beauty salon on that property going to find out the R2 office zoning did not allow for beauty parlors. And he brought this forward, coordinated with the property owners to his immediate north at 5761, excuse me, 4761 and 4771 North 9th Avenue to create RNC for all four of those parcels because immediately to the north it's C1 zoning, which is a more intensive commercial and what's left to the south would be the R2 office. So what you do is you kind of graduate the intensity of use down 9th Avenue, connecting C1, R and C, and then back to, to the, the office use, instead of having just one isolated parcel R and C amongst what still would be office uses. So he brought the, this request before. It was heard by the planning board back in January, and they did approve bringing it before council. OK. Any uh, questions or comments? Ms. Stoyce. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I did have a quick question about the buffering in this area because of all the neighborhoods that come right up to almost to 9th Avenue. <clears throat> and I thought I noted a pretty good green belt uh, between with some trees and some pretty good growth. Is that um, expected to stay? Is that something that's part of the zoning with this to create a buffer if something is already in place that we ask that that stay there? 
instead of a privacy fence going up and it looking like a fort, if we have some natural space. Mr. Kelly. Particularly for the two properties there on the, uh, the northwest corner of 9th Avenue that to include the Springfield property, that is currently a vacant property and that mm -hmm. would have to go through the complete development review to include a 20-foot buffering requirement to the adjacent residential property. Mm -hmm. the existing two businesses, the one on the, south, the southwest corner is an insurance office and anticipated to stay that way and the other one will be a beauty shop which was previously an office and that there is some buffering there. Okay, because I think the nor the one on the north is what I saw that, that had quite a Vic, and it would be sub subject to everything buffering. in our land development code as far as development. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, anybody else on council? I don't have any um, show anybody from the public question to speak on this. If you do though, um, rise and come down to the podium there, but I'll need you to fill out a blue card before you do. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, uh, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Please vote. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. There's no quasi-judicial hearings. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we do have a presentation that we failed to uh, give uh, at the committee the whole on uh, specifically referring to uh, uh, Bayfront Park Parkway item number H and I'd like the opportunity to have that presented at this point. Sure. And I'll have uh, Mr. Al Garza come down and uh, make the introductions. Good evening President Hall, members of council, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, we're here to give you a brief overview of the project that you approved last Monday regarding the uh, Bayfront landscaping from Alconies to 17th Avenue. Mr. Bruce Brodsky is here from Atkins Consulting to uh, give you the highlights of that project. Council members, uh, good evening. Um, we'll go with this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Bayfront Parkway landscape enhancement, <clears throat> as you know, is an FDOT joint participation agreement project, a JPA project, uh, and as such it has undergone um, extensive review uh, by the DOT of the landscape plans and, uh, and therefore the design does meet all FDOT safety and setback requirements. Um, there's a $250,000 grant from the DOT and that is for landscape and irrigation materials, installation and maintenance. It does not include any administration uh, of the project. <clears throat> the project extends from Alcony Street on the west to 17th Avenue on the east. It includes all of the medians along the way as well as that rather large triangular shaped area at the corner of uh, 17th Avenue and Bayfront Parkway. As you look at this slide you'll see the red dot in the center of the slide which is immediately adjacent to um, Admiral Mason Park <clears throat> and that dot is where the existing median opening is going to be closed and I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. Oops. Um, the plant palette for the project consists of all native plants that are adapted to exposed coastal conditions which is mainly salt spray <clears throat> and wind, although um, it also includes sandy soils that are uh, of uh, low nutrient value. Um, the sand live oaks are going to be planted in clusters with mm. saw palmetto beneath them, and that is the way that you would typically see those growing in nature in this type of environment. Um, the clustering of the trees, when the trees are clustered, they actually wind up protecting each other from the elements, so um, when you do get inevitable natural pruning from some storms, um, it's not as noticeable because it's still a nice cluster. Uh, as opposed to if you have the trees planted typically like you see 50, 60 feet apart and you get some damage to one of them, it's got nothing protecting it and it's just a exposed damaged tree. Um, <clears throat> I actually think that once the oak trees mature, once the saw palmetto matures and all the other plants that we're using fill in, that it may actually look like one day that the oak trees were there first and that the parkway, because of the way it curves, was actually designed around those trees to protect those trees. Uh, that would be a nice effect and hopefully that's what it will look like. 
Um, some of the other plants that we're using, dwarf yopon holly is a great native plant. When you leave it alone, it grows into these mounds that are about two to three feet tall, these thick mounds of the plant, and it's a very nice, natural look, needs no care. There is a tendency, for some reason, for people to want to prune dwarf yopon holly into what I call these cannonball shapes, and we definitely don't want that. We just want to leave it alone and let it look as natural as possible. Uh, Gulf muley grass. This is going to be the star of the show when it comes fall time, because in the fall, for about four to six weeks, the plants get covered with pink flowers. And the way we're using the Gulf muley grass is in these large masses. And I think when people are driving down uh, Bayfront Parkway mm -hmm. with the muley grass in its full glory, that's something that's going to be very impressive, something that people are going to remember and look forward to seeing year after year. Kunti. Kunti is an ancient plant. It's been around for millions of years, which tells us right away that it's a survivor and it will do well in this difficult environment. It uh, has a very interesting texture. It has a very interesting form. It looks like a fern, as you can see, but it's not actually a fern. And uh, it will add nice interest to our overall palette. And finally, the last plant that we're using mm -hmm. is shore juniper of the blue Pacifica variety, and I must confess that shore juniper is not a native, however, not a native to this area. However, it does look like a native, it does act like a native, and it's a very good plant for where we want to use it, which is on uh, the noses of the median openings, or just back from the medians, because it only grows to about a foot tall, so there will never be an issue with visibility for uh, cars making turns. This slide shows the location of the current median opening that will be closed. It's immediately across from Admiral Mason Park, as I said earlier, and it really goes nowhere. To the north is the park, to the south is the bay. So that opening is strictly for U-turns. But by closing it, it gives us a much greater flexibility with our plant material. When it's open, we have to keep the plant material low for quite a distance on either side of it, and that restricts us to just a few plants. By closing the median opening, we can then use our full palette and uh, the oak clusters, as you can see in the dark green um, in this slide. What will our landscape enhancements provide? Well, one thing they certainly provide is aesthetics, including the framing of views with the sand live oaks to the bay in certain strategic locations. Um, the landscape enhancement provides low maintenance after establishment. Uh, there's no turf in this plan. There's limited pruning. Once the plants fill in nicely, there will be little opportunity for weeds to get a foothold. And um, there will be little need for replenishing mulch because there won't be a lot of exposed area between the plants. And finally, low water usage. These are plants that are not used to a lot of water. They don't like a lot of water. They actually perform better once established if they don't have a lot of water. So after we get them established, which will take six months to a year, the irrigation system, and there is an irrigation system, can be cut way back or uh, turned off um, completely. And with that, if anybody has any questions. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Council. Thank you, Mr. President. Does any of these plants bloom? Uh, the muley grass does flower. The rest of the plants do not. Okay. Uh, I noticed at the beginning of your presentation, uh, you mentioned uh, included in the grant was the maintenance. Uh, somewhere I recall Monday that I thought when I read the background about it that to receive the uh, grant that the city was required to do the maintenance of the of this uh, yes, sir. area. After the first year, the maintenance is included for the first year only. Okay, of the grant. And then after that, that the city will be required. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Dr. Wood and Mr. Weiss. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, the, uh, first of all, um, congratulations on what's been done up to this point because it looks absolutely wonderful down there. I remember the first time I drove down there, I thought I was in the wrong place for a minute because uh, the contrast, the sewer plant in rubbles on the right 
to the beauty of what's been done there is, is absolutely stunning. My question is, is the uh, meeting that you'd like to close up, is that straight beside us here that we're talking about, the, the road running right by the building here? Um, no, that's out adjacent to Admiral Mason Park. There's one median opening. <clears throat> Yeah, near the Missing Children's Memorial, just to the west of the Missing Children's oh. Memorial. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Mr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. President. I would just like to request an electronic copy and, if possible, a printed copy of this. <coughs> and I uh, look forward to seeing it installed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spencer. Thank you. I think many of us are um, still elated or we're in a state of elation after seeing the transformation of Main Street and I'm excited about the continuation of, the, of a transformation. Most importantly, I think for um, many people they have been somewhat um, confused about where do they turn to change this sort of speedway aesthetic? How do we, how do we create um, a sense of arrival for our city that is something grander and more exciting than just, um, again, a speedway. And this will go a long way in reducing, I think, that, that thoroughfare sort of context by dividing that uh, wide abyss of basically featureless um, landscaping or non-landscaping. So. I'm just very excited about it. Thank you, Dr. Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to say thank you for the presentation. It was, it was nice to see it in full color um, and see exactly what you're aiming for. And I just wanted to remind the council, we've been talking about our goal setting and, and reviewing our previous goals, that, that um, landscaping like this was one of our goals to try to work towards low maintenance, low water usage and things. And, and you know, sometimes it takes a while for us to start the ball rolling, but I hope that, that this will help us see how we can start doing this kind of landscaping in other places to, to reduce the, just the impact of most of the things we do. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Myers. Yes, I, I am very impressed with uh, the, pre, pre, the presentation and the selection of the plants. Um, and I would like to see us continue to uh, beautify the rest of the city and the rest of our gateways and using these types of plants and aesthetics, not just for the southern gateway, but northern, eastern, western, um, and especially the airport area. Uh, I think first impressions are very important and while we're, we're on that subject, when I come across the, the bridge from Gulf Breeze, one of the first things that catches my eye are those blue plastic garbage cans over <laughs> in Wayside Park. And while we're putting beautiful plants in, can we possibly address the issue of putting some aesthetic garbage cans in? Also, thank you. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the garbage can, I'll t address that real quick. There's, we did have those garbage cans at Bayview Park, and we were able to get some more attractive ones, so I would uh, support that also. Uh, sir, I was wondering the start and finish uh, of this project. When do you, when do you uh, anticipate that things go well here tonight? Uh, uh, when will you start and when will you finish this project? Councilman Johnson, we'll be uh, releasing a contract to executive tomorrow uh, with the objective of having this project done by June, end of June. Okay, because we've got fireworks and et cetera that we need to pay attention to. Um, um, and I hate to have this, this project uh, undergoing uh, completion when, that, uh, when that's going on. Also, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I like the fact that it sounds like we're going to have a very, not have to water it so much and, and pesticides and fertilizers will not be as required for, the, for this type of vegetation. Is that correct? 
That is correct. These are all native plants, and if they get established well, they should require minimum maintenance. Okay. You know, I, I continue to talk about pesticides and fertilizers and how it affects our waterways and um, any uh, efforts in regard of reducing those uh, uh, pesticides and fertilizers. I, uh, I would encourage this council to support. Thank you. Mr. Gerald. Thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Pratt for her comments as it relates to the strategic planning day that we have set forth because it tells me that uh, she's now looking at those strategic plans and I want to make sure and I'll take advantage of every opportunity I get. It makes me feel good to know that, uh, that I can state that uh, Amir um, Hayward is actually carrying out the plans that we'd set forth in 2009. So those people who have arrived at uh, Pensacola recently and believe that these are new ideas, these were ideas that we had uh, as a council and they are being put forth. And that's the purpose of getting together and reviewing the strategic plans that had been set forth is make sure that we delineate our role as a legislative body versus the mayor's role as the person who's responsible for the operation, the day-to-day -day operation of the city of Pensacola as well as moving the city of Pensacola forward. So for those of you who think that we may not be working in unison or working together, uh, if you attend the strategic planning day that we have set forth, you will see that indeed we are working together. It may be of an invisible nature, but in fact, it, it, things are working out and hopefully the city will continue to get better and better. But the strategic plans are very important to our movements, both as a council and as for uh, Ashton Haywood as our mayor. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Garza, regarding the project you and I met on yesterday, I like these plans here. So if you keep those in mind, appreciate it. Thank you. Right, okay, sir. thanks to both of you. Thank you. Mr. Reynolds? Uh, nothing further, Mr. President, but I, I just uh, will uh, let Council know it. I just forwarded to all of you uh, the electronic copy of this presentation. Presentation, Thank okay. You. Thank you. Uh, Council Communications. <laughs> Mr. Weist and Ms. Myers. Thank you, Mr. President. I feel like I'm speaking every uh, time we have something new come up, so I apologize. I think I'm done after this. I just wanted to make Council aware of the information I've put in front of you tonight. The National Complete Streets Coalition uh, Complete Streets Workshop that I said I would research and get more information on. There is an email at the bottom of that, uh, Ms. Linda Tracy, that you can email with questions. Um, she does have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday office days if you wanted to speak with her directly at that phone number. Um, but this is the basis for getting a community effort together for talking about Complete Streets policy. And uh, I also had asked Ms. Major to send you just the link of the newsletter about two weeks ago so you could start getting that information and understand just how revolutionary this is around the country. There's so many municipalities, either cities or even counties, that are passing new policy for complete streets to make sure that all users are considered when we're doing any improvements. And that legislation on this level, on the granular level, changes what FDOT will do or changes what plans on a federal level will do. So we can change our future simply by putting this in place. So I look forward to, um, I know Dr. Pratt has been working very hard on um, trying to, to craft some policy guidelines, a framework, and I hope that this will be part of our strategic planning session on May 30th and that we can move forward with that at that time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Myers. Uh, yes, I just have a couple of things. First, um, I want to thank Councilwoman DeWeese for providing us with this information. As you know, I've been an advocate for complete street uh, adoption of an ordinance and policies here at the uh, City Council. I read in, the, in a p newspaper the other day that the little town of Fairhope, Alabama, is the first city in Alabama to adopt a complete street policy and ordinance, and they're actually implementing it. And I understand that uh, Councilwoman DeWeese has been over there and uh, actually seen some of the um, uh, implementation of their ordinance. So I think it would just be great for us to uh, develop uh, a complete street policy and ordinances if necessary. Um, I wanted to also announce 
uh, that um, a restaurant called um, um, I'm sorry it's, it's, <laughs> um, it's uh, on the corner of it's next to Publix Jordan Jordan Cafe. Valley Cafe Jordan Valley pardon Jordan Valley Jordan Valley yes thank you uh, they have a restaurant down here on Palafox I believe and they have a, will be opening um, a restaurant there uh, on Ninth Avenue, just right there at the uh, Publix uh, parking lot. And uh, they have great food. Uh, they had a, a ribbon cutting the other day, which I attended. And so uh, I encourage people to uh, check that uh, restaurant out. The food is very good. Um, I wanted to bring up an issue. I don't know if Mr. Garz is here or not, but I don't want to put him on the spot. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to bring this up tonight because a number of people in uh, around the Sanders Street area uh, have asked me uh, why uh, the sidewalks that are being put in on Sanders Street from Langley to Creighton are being uh, installed by the county. However, one block on that street is in the city limits. The, the sidewalks have been completed. Uh, the uh, Roads uh, Inc. was out uh, today putting, putting out sod. And um, we, we just cannot have a street with one block without a sidewalk. And I'm wondering, for the benefit of the public and council, if Mr. Reynolds, you might have uh, some information on what the city intends to do with that block. I don't, I don't want the citizens to think that the city is just going to leave them that one block without a sidewalk. Well, uh, thank well, you. Well, before Mr. Reynolds um, um, answers, uh, I do want to point out that that one block is still in the county and uh, the county okay. opted not to, to put the sidewalk there. But anyway, okay. Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Garza and I actually had a conversation, or I guess it was an email conversation, uh, about this uh, uh, when it came out in the newspaper. But uh, uh, we're certainly looking at that, and uh, if necessary, uh, and if it is our property, uh, this is the first I've heard that it was, was actually the county. But if it is the city, we will make sure that we have sidewalks there. Okay. That take care of you, Ms. Myers. Well, uh, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm surprised that you said that it was in the county because um, I was under the impression that that one block is in the city limits. Well, that, which so. uh, all of 100% of Pensacola is in the county. Okay, <laughs> but that, that's true, but this one block happens to be within the city limit boundaries. Their garbage cans are, are black. So I guess that makes them in the city limits. Yes, no, no argument. No argument with you there. <laughs> so, I'm just saying that the county could have sprung for another block. Of but I, I think Mr. Garza is working with the county to, so to solve this problem, and I just don't want the citizens to think that the city is, is not doing anything. Oh, the city is doing something to, to and, and has, has been actually working with the county on, on that, uh, and there's just some detail that needs to be worked out, and uh, I just want the citizens to know that, that the city is not going to leave that block without a sidewalk. I don't think that's going to happen. Okay, thank you, Ms. Myers. Mr. Townsend. Thank you, and I think I've been talking too much also, but in any event, I just want to make mention to the citizens that the streets that are being uprooted by on the west side uh, by ECU, they are doing a project and they will not be left like that. So just bear with those streets like on EF down in the southern part of the city, uh, government intendential Romana, it's all over that they are doing some work on some corroded pipes or something of that nature, but they will in fact uh, come back and straighten up those streets. The other thing of, of note, I think, is uh, the recent uh, victory that uh, Bubba Watson had at the, the Masters Golf Tournament. Now, you might wonder why I mentioned that. Uh, Bubba has been very helpful in 
supporting a lot of uh, the activities in, in Northwest Florida, even though he has moved to uh, uh, Arizona, he's from Baghdad. But the first T uh, gets a tremendous amount of support uh, uh, from Bubba Watson, all of the professional golfers that are located in this area. Uh, the uh, Divin Derby, Derby uh, uh, Tournament, uh, which is a uh, tournament for youngsters, uh, he supports that and paid uh, uh, an exceptional amount of money uh, for that. So uh, I think I applaud him for his victory. It's just another example of the tremendous athletes that we do have coming coming from this area. And uh, when you see him, I would think that we need to say thank you, Bubba, for all you do for our kids uh, coming up in first tee, uh, Divid Derby, and all of the support that he's giving to various other activities from Baghdad to Milton uh, on down. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Pratt, Mr. Johnson, then Mr. Geralds. Thank you, Mr. President. I um, wanted to follow up with Councilwoman DeWeese's um, paper she gave out to us, and um, I think that, that this is a great resource that, that should be tapped. Um, we, I think we sort of got a little um, off track with some of the Complete Streets things, partially working through our processes. And um, I know that the attorney has the, the, the sort of faux ordinance I, I gave to take shots at. If we do want to consider it again, I think that could be pulled up again pretty easily. So um, if that's the council's interest, we could probably convince him to put it on. Um, second item is I um, wanted to send congratulations uh, for, to Scenic Heights this Saturday. They're going to have a ribbon cutting for their very first Scenic Heights signs. The Neighborhood Association has been in existence for a little over two years, and they've gotten very energetic, and they're going to have a big ribbon cutting event and a ribbon cutting for the new disc golf um, course in Hitzman Park. It's not that's not going to compete with first tee, but it's another good thing to do. I don't know that we have professional disc golf that people can go to be the masters, but it'll be a good thing for people and it'll be a great day on Saturday. And I, I have to share condolences that I'm uh, obligated with my other job to not be able to be there, but I hope that they have a wonderful time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Yeah. Thank you very much. And, uh, Ditto to uh, congratulations to Bubba Watson. You know, we've had some great athletes uh, 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 coming out of this area. Uh, Bubba Watson, Trent Richardson won the national championship here in January, and uh, last year we uh, recognized Josh Sitton. So a uh, lot, lot of great athletes out of this area, and, and I just want to recognize them again. The uh, other thing I think we should mention is that uh, we recently had uh, 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 the Blue Wahoos played here across the street, and we had five sold-out games. Um, I had heard many things from the community about parking issues, about uh, bringing Main Street down to two lanes. Uh, many, many of these uh, issues that uh, that were of concern of, of certain uh, individuals in our community. And uh, from what I can tell, things went off pretty smoothly. Um, we had again five sold-out games, uh, over 5,000 people at uh, at uh, our stadium here across the street. And uh, I just think things went real, real smooth. I want to thank everyone that, uh, that, that helped with that effort. I want to congratulate the, uh, the Wahoos on winning uh, the most of those games, not all of them. And I hear they're struggling a little bit in Mobile, but hopefully they'll come back and get to their winning ways. Um, the other thing I think that's it, it's, uh, noteworthy is that Monday night we had uh, an event at Sanger Theater, had two shows, one at 7 and one at 9.30. It was a comedian named Tosh. And uh, it was sold out. So we had uh, in Pensacola, downtown Pensacola, I think it's, it, that we should recognize that we had over 3,000 people visit our Sanger Theater. Um, about 3,500 people visit our Sanger Theater with the two shows Monday night. And just right down the street, blocks from the Sanger Theater, we had a sold out baseball game of 5,000 people. So collectively there, we had almost 9,000 people in downtown Pensacola. And what I'm hearing from our merchants and all, um, there was uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of folks, a lot of uh, excitement, a lot of money uh, spent in our downtown area. I had a restaurant uh, person tell me that uh, it was a big, big night for them Monday night. So you know, I just want to thank everyone, and, and uh, I'm, I'm really encouraged with, this, with this, this, uh, this type of stuff. I mean, it just seems like we're headed in the right direction, and, uh, and I just wanted to think it was noteworthy to mention that, uh, both those things. But to have two sold-out uh, events in, in Pensacola, on Monday night, I think uh, I think is pretty impressive. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Gerald. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll be brief this evening. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is the fact that the disparity study is moving along slowly. However, we're not getting the level of, the level of, pr of participation that we had anticipated. And a part of it, I was told that it may be because of fear of retaliation. But I want to encourage the audience and uh, to know that Mr. Reggie Smith takes additional caution in making sure that your comments or the, the information that you share with them, not with me, but with them, is held in strictest confidence. So if anyone is having a problem that they need to discuss and try to find a solution, now would be the time, simply because without sufficient information, evidence, whether good or bad, it will be difficult to make a, uh, a good decision or to make good recommendations. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I will in encourage people that there will be a couple of more meetings between now and the time that the report comes out, but I would encourage citizens, if they've had a problem, if they have something they'd like to share with Mr. Reggie Smith of MGT, to please don't hesitate to participate in those meetings so that we will have a better picture of what's been going on in the city of Pensacola, thereby giving them the opportunity to better uh, evaluate what has happened and make appropriate recommendations. My last comment <clears throat> involves, and I'm not one of those people who um, uh, we'll sit around and wait for someone else to ring my bell. I'll ring it myself. And I want to make sure that you folks know that you're sitting among an individual who recently received a distinguished alumni award from the University of West Florida. That means you're in good company when you're sitting with me. Um, and of 76,000 graduates of the University of Florida, West Florida thus far, and they remembered me, I feel quite honored. I was there for a brief period. I did what I was supposed to do, graduated, and was out of there within a reasonable amount of time. It's important uh, because, and I shared this story with the, the audience at the banquet, the dinner, that uh, when in 1963, when I heard about the fact that a four-year university would be coming to Pensacola, I was in the 11th grade when we received that information. But at the same time, we were told that we would not be able to attend that university, that we would still have to go to leave home to, to get a, a, a four-year degree or a master's degree. And at that time, I was saddened by the follow-up information due to the segregated rules of education in the state of Florida, not just in Escambia, but in the state of Florida. And um, it makes me feel really good that I defied the thinking and the actions of those days by coming back to Pensacola, attending that university, and graduating with a, a master's in ed leadership. And I just wanted you folks to know that, that um, I was quite honored. And uh, those of you who did not know, you now know, because I'll ring the bell myself. I'm that kind of guy. I'm not waiting for anybody to ring my bell. I'll ring it. Because if I wait for y'all to ring it, it may not get rung. So I'll ring my own bell when necessary. Now, I have been told not to brag or to gloat or this or that. But I'm a bell ringer. I'll ring the bell for whatever's going on. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, and thank you, and congratulations, sir. Uh, Mr. Spencer, Ms. Myers, and Dr. Wu. Thank you. Um, today I received a phone call from a constituent in District 6 uh, regarding a code enforcement issue, and I drove out to look at the subject property. Um, what that request led to is something I, I hope that we will all be able to benefit from, and that is the eventual coordination of code violations um, and the basically the listing of those with the help of code enforcement working perhaps uh, under the direction of our city administrator and um, working with MIS. My, my wish is that we as council members may be able to have um, readily available and accessible information regarding code violations in our district while we can um, certainly go through the process of contacting our code enforcement officers. They're, they're busy. They're, they're often out on the streets. But um, ideally, we will um, my hope is that we'll be able to see on a regular basis what list of new code violations may exist and that will allow us to be not only proactive but informed and, and armed when we hear from perhaps those that receive the code violation and, and they 
would understandably most of the time be upset when they contact us. We'll have more information and be prepared to have a, um, a discussion with them. And also it allows us to tell our constituents what I learned, for instance, today is that the old East Hill neighborhood area just uh, recently had a sweep of um, that provided 17 um, notifications or code violations. So um, I, that's sort of fresh off the press, hot off the press, and, and um, certainly I know that it will require some administration and coordination with MIS inspections and our city administrator, Mr. Reynolds, may want to comment on that, but um, that's what I wanted to share with you. Well, thank you, sir. Ms. Myers. Yes, I just wanted to congratulate uh, Councilman Geralds and um, also uh, for telling us about your accomplishment and award, but also reminding us about history, too. And um, so I just wanted to thank you for sharing that information with us. Thank you. Dr. Wu? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So uh, Councilman Geralds will not be the only one ringing his bell. I'd mm -hmm. like to chime in as well and congratulate him on his well-deserved order uh, award. As a former professor, it was privileged enough to have him in several classes. I can also attest that it was well-deserved and well-earned. Congratulations, Councilman. Thank you, sir. Okay. Madam Clerk, are there any petitions? No, sir. Okay. Next up is our uh, consent agenda. These are items that passed unanimously uh, this past Monday um, at the Committee of the Whole. And uh, we have several items here. Uh, appointment, General Pension Board. Item B, Special Magistrate. C, Law Enforcement Trust Fund Purchases. D, Resolution Supporting Florida Emerald Coast Clean Cities Coalition. E, Resolution Supporting Choice Neighborhoods Planning Grant Application. F, Change Order Number 1, Hewitt Street Reconstruction and Stormwater Enhancement Project. Item G, Award of Contract, bid number 12-012-FY2012 Street Rehabilitation Project. H, Award of Contract, bid number 12-022-Bayfront Parkway Median Landscaping Project. And item I, Request to Rename Woodland Heights Park to William E. McNeely Sr. Park. I ask for approval of all items um, I will be holding number I. We have two members of the audience that wish to speak to that. So I move the approval. Second. There's a motion and a second. Now, like I said, we'll be voting on um, items A through H. Any comments? Please vote. And those pass unanimously. And on the request to rename Woodland Heights Park the William E. McNeely Senior Park, uh, first speaker is Mr. Walter Wallace. And following him will be uh, uh, the Reverend uh, Hugh King. Hey, Councilman. Uh, my name is Walter Wallace. I'm president of the Woodland Night Neighbors Association. I'm also a member of the Council of Neighborhood President of Pensacola. First off, I want to thank you for your speedy action on this. I think the last time I was here, I think we spoke and I told you this is a project that we've been talking about ever since November. And uh, to piggyback on Councilman Jerry, we congratulate you. Also, I'm a firm believer like my grandma, my aunt always said, give me my flowers where I can smell it. Uh, un unfortunate, what we're asking you to do tonight is to rename the Woodland Heights Park to the Reverend William E. McNeely Senior Park. Unfortunately, he would not be able to know that so over the future that we may be able to give everybody their flowers and where they do why they can smell them but Reverend McNeil I think the last time I, I gave y'all a little boxer here but uh, <coughs> as you know he served at Pastor of Bethlehem Church at 511 Woodland Drive across the street from the park for 34 years uh, he was, uh, was a pastor uh, in the AME uh, okay. church for over 54 years uh, but I read Bob's, but one thing I, that always 
remind me of Reverend McNeely is that in 1996, when we started, me and some of our neighbors thought about forming the Woodland Heights Neighborhood Association. At the time, uh, Councilman, uh, our councilman was Ms. Reedy Jones. But we got together and, and we went to Reverend McNeely for his support, and it was automatic because he felt that his church and the individuals he were to make sure that the neighborhood grow, that he had to be a part of it. And he opened up his church to us, he opened up his advice to us, all the time constantly supporting our neighbors, our neighborhood and our neighbor association. And uh, one thing always stuck with me that he told me one time, he said, if we, you take care, we build this neighborhood up, and the next neighborhood across the street, they build their neighborhood up, and the next one build his neighborhood up. He said, you step back, you got a beautiful city. Mm -hmm. So I ask you today, tonight, unanimously, uh, and the rename the Woodland Heights Park to the Reverend, uh, Reverend William E. McNeely Park. Thank you. Okay, and thank you, sir. Reverend King. I want to laugh for the vote. Okay, be fine. Please vote. Okay, thank you. Reverend King, that passes unanimously. Um, Mr. President, having Mr. McNeely here, the family just want to express appreciation when you come down to this. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and Council. I was told to be the spokesperson for the McNeely family tonight. This is Mrs. Annette McNeely. This is um, in the absence of Ronald McNeely and his family who live in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, Darlene, Christian, Lauren, and Matthew. And this is Mrs. Alicia McNeely King, Reverend McNeely's daughter, and our children, Hugh Jr. and Sean Wee. I um, just want to say, first of all, thank God for the life and legacy of William E. McNeely, Sr. I want to thank Mr. Walter Wallace, the Willen Heights Neighborhood Association, and the council for approving this. This is a very noble and kind gesture. It means a great deal to the family. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Mr. Weiss. Thank yeah. you, Mr. President, and I did just want to congratulate the family and um, tell you my first experience with naming of a park was Miss Peden, um, a park over off of Creighton Road and, and Ninth. And I didn't know Mr. McNeely, Reverend McNeely, but I do know the mark that someone can leave on people's lives and being in one community <coughs> and caring for others around you. And I'm just proud that we're able to do this tonight, and uh, I hope he's looking down and, and proud as well. Okay. You have at least one more, uh, Mr. Gerald. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. President. Just briefly, and I recognize Mr. Lee and the president of the Woodland Heights Neighborhood Association, Mr. Walter Wallace. Um, I cannot think, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize Mr. Wallace for his continued efforts uh, at the Woodland Heights Park, uh, which is located in District 5. And um, <coughs> when this idea came before council, it was almost what some people would call a, a no-brainer in that we knew the right thing to do. And I thank Council for its cooperation and participation in this effort, and congratulations to the Magnolia family. It was well-deserved. Thank, thank, thank you. Mr. Townsend. Thank you. Uh, I have to agree with uh, Councilman Gerald uh, in terms of uh, his description, a no-brainer. I um, did a, a lot of activity with uh, Reverend uh, Magnolia, even though I'm Catholic. I uh, had a tremendous uh, relationship with him, especially in the community. 
as the equal opportunity officer for the Naval Air Station, I had tremendous amount of dealings with him in trying to assist in identifying uh, individuals for jobs, upper mobility, and those kinds of things. And every time that I would call and ask for his assistance at the Naval Air Station or the Chief of Naval Education and Training, uh, he did not say no. He would come and assist and give me advice. And so I'm really pleased and proud that I had an opportunity to be a part of, of this well-deserved. Thanks so much. Mrs. <clears throat> McNeely and uh, Reverend King and your family, uh, um, thank you. We have two items under our committee report. Uh, these are items that did not pass unanimously at uh, the Monday Committee of the Whole meeting. The first one is the Maritime Park commemorative plaque that City Council members' names be included on the commemorative plaque at the Vince Webb Senior Community Maritime Park. The motion passed six to two. Council members Hall and Spencer dissenting and Council member Johnson absent for the vote. Move the approval. Second. There's a motion and a second. Um, Mr. Townsend. Thank you. Uh, after reflecting back on, on this issue, Monday at the uh, committee of the whole meeting. I still can't figure out the mystery as to why we needed to discuss names on this particular uh, plaque. Uh, I guess it's just the nature of the beast that we're part of. Um, I went around and looked at some various memorial plaques in, within the city and of significant plaques of outstanding completions of projects that, that we have achieved. Uh, and it was reflective that of the uh, city council members of that time, uh, parish members, et cetera, who were actively involved in making a, a determination and decisions about, about the project. Uh, I remembered Monday's meeting and where the name of the city manager uh, Al Colby, the previous city manager, came up and, and it appeared that it just flew over our head and uh, no one made mention of it. But I guarantee you that park would not be over there for the efforts and the activity of Al Colby. Numerous hours, all night, preparing reports for the council to make a decision. And you can feel somewhat 97% assured that when Al brought it to you, he had done a complete work on the project. Uh, felt real comfortable in accepting whatever recommendation that Al brought forth. Some of them I didn't agree with, but I know that he had done the best that, that he could regarding that. So with that being said, I would like to make an amendment to this motion uh, in terms of including uh, Mr. Colby's name as city manager on that plaque. Second. There is a motion and a second to amend. Um, and if I, I've, got two, I've got two lights on, and I, I may ask you to turn them back on. I clear the lights right now because I just want people speaking to the amendment itself. Okay. Dr. Pratt and then Dr. Wu. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I agree wholeheartedly, though I, I hope that there's a friendly amendment to also include Mr. Bonfield, who was, I think you just said Mr. Kobe, but Mr. Bonfield was also involved. And I just wanted to explain briefly the piece of paper in front of you. Um, I, I had intended, and when I started working on the document that we saw on Monday, to include the, those two gentlemen, and I was half photoshopping sort of crazy and I just I got too swamped and I, was, I forgot to, to double check but um, the document in front of you um, I got a call from Mr. Ed Spears this week saying that he had prepared a, a mock-up and I, I spoke with him and I said you know somehow we didn't quite decide on the Bonfield Kobe question and he said oh I already put it in there based on the conversation and so the the document he I he gave to me to give to you. Um, there are two versions, a sideways and a vertical, but um, that was sort of what he was thinking we were going to, to approve tonight to, to become the plaque, and that does include that, and so I do hope the amendment passes. 
Yes, and it, it, so I'd like to include Mr. Bonfield because of the inaccurate of it, he was the city manager when we actually started this. And if, if we're talking about preferences, I would like to deal with this top one here and not this one on the side. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and it's, it, it's interesting that uh, um, if, if you go back and look at some of the pre-discussions before the public announcement um, on uh, the Maritime Park, uh, it was kind of Mr. Bonfeld that directed um, the efforts to happen there. The, the, the plans had been as trying to secure um, one of the sites up, uh, um, I think it was the Scambia Treating Site. Um, it had been the, the original choice and was looking for city support on being able to use that, and he redirected it um, I'm down here. So, Dr. Wood and then Mr. Weiss. Uh, I, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to um, ditto everything Councilwoman Pratt has just said and everything uh, Councilman Townsend. There's an article in the Florida Independent uh, by Rick Altson. It talks about the park, and it starts off about the two main principals meeting with Tom Bonfield. And uh, it had a, he not been in that capacity, uh, he's the one that brought it to me and the other council members. So uh, I'm very pleased to see his name as well as Al Kobe's name included. And I too favored a very first top sheet. Thank you, Mr. President. Right, thank you, Ms. Myers. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Weiss and Ms. Myers. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to make sure there's the two different na uh, dates on these versions with Pensacola City Council 2004 to 2012 and the one that is vertical is 2005 to 2012. So I just didn't know if that was an error or, or why, but that it be one or the other, whichever we choose. I think that it originally said 2004 because of the term of that council. Yeah, but I don't think that original vote was taken until the, what, those that were elected right. in 04 were seated in, in, in right. 05. So one version says one and one says yeah. the other. So yeah. whatever Mr. Spears intended when he sent it over, I just wanted to make sure that he knew. Well, I, I, I'd just like for to make sure that it's clear. I know the final decision, I guess, comes from CMPA on, on this. But I'd, I would support the 05 version of it. Okay, um, Ms. Myers. Yes, and I just wanted to state that I, I do support uh, adding uh, the name of uh, the names of uh, Mr. Bonfield and Mr. Kobe, and also that I prefer the top sheet. I think is a lot easier to read and look looks better from my perspective. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Wu. Oh, no, fine. Okay. Um, I will be supporting the, the amendment. I've still got to make up my mind on the main, main, main motion, but I will be supporting the amendment. There's no other comments. Uh, please vote. Okay, and that passes unanimously. Um, now we're back to the main motion as, as amended. Any comments on that? <coughs> okay, and none from the public. Seeing none, please vote. Mr. Geralds. Mr. Geralds. Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item is renaming of Exchange Park. The City Council rename Exchange Park to Mike DeSorbo Park, subject to further information from Exchange Clubs of Florida. That motion passed 5 2. Council Members Myers and Spencer dissenting, and Council Members Hall and Johnson absent for the vote. Move to approve. Second. There is a motion and a second. Discussion? Okay, please vote. <coughs> and that passes now, so Ms. Deweese. Yes, I, thank you, Mr. President. I would just very quickly like to state and, and hopes that we can still keep this a secret and surprise. Mr. DeSorbo does not know this is even happening, um, and we haven't finalized when it would be presented. So. If any members of the press could just leave that out of the news for now, um, and as well as if we see Mr. DeSorbo, certainly smile big, but mom is the word right now. Thank okay. you. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> I know, but good job. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
report uh, of the Community Redevelopment Agency. Sir, we had a fairly lively CRA meeting, didn't we? I will not have a lively report, Mr. President. Okay. <laughs> All right. Our Community Redevelopment Agency met on April 9th. Um, all board members were present. We approved the March 5th CRA board meeting minutes. That uh, motion to approve the minutes as submitted um, passed unanimously. We also had an, an item regarding a request for payment of an invoice to Mr. Barry Abramson and Associates. We had um, a letter produced by him with backup material. The CRA unanimously voted to deny that request for payment. And in addition to those items that we voted on, the Community Redevelopment Agency had a brief presentation, an update by Brian Hooper, Chairman of the <coughs> Urban Redevelopment Advisory Committee. We also um, wished Mr. Brian Hooper a happy birthday and congratulated him for being a father with a three-day-old baby. We all then concluded with a presentation by Mr. Matt Altier, uh, UWF, an executive vice president, I believe, who provided for us a, um, an overview of a co the concept of cultural heritage tourism. That concludes my unlively report. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, ordinances on the first reading. Item 14A, please. Item 14A is proposed ordinance number 08-12, an ordinance to be entitled, an ordinance amending the comprehensive plan and future land use map of the city of Pensacola, Florida, repealing clause providing an effective date. Move the approval. Second. Sir. Motion is second. Comments? Please move. That passes unanimously. Mr. Johnson is absent for the vote. Item 14B. Item 14B is proposed ordinance number 09-12, an ordinance to be entitled, an ordinance amending the zoning classification of certain property pursuant to and consistent with the comprehensive plan of the City of Pensacola, amending the zoning map of the City of Pensacola, <coughs> clause and effective date. Move the approval. Second. Motion and a second. <coughs> Comments? Sure. Please vote. Dr. Wu. Dr. Wu. That passes unanimously. Mr. Johnson's absence of the vote. Item 15, uh, ordinances on the second reading. Item 15A. Item 15A is proposed ordinance number 06-12, an ordinance to be entitled, an ordinance amending section 12-2-78 of the Code of the City of Pensacola, Florida, amending conditional use regulations, providing for severability, repealing clause, providing an effective date. Will be approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. I have one uh, person who wants to speak on this, uh, Mr. Michael Caro. Members of the City Council, I appreciate the time to speak today. Um, I was absent at the last meeting, so I apologize for that, but if you did have any questions, uh, that's what I really came to answer. Um, I was also going to share um, some of the boards that we have that were passed in the uh, planning board meeting um, at the uh, planning board if you had any questions about what we are proposing to do. Mr. Townsend? Is it going to look like this? Yes, sir. Well, you know, I objected. I, I voted no last time. If you had these here, you probably you wouldn't have got voted no. Looks good. I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, we have engaged, um, you know, obviously, uh, architect Brian Spencer uh, and Horton Landscapes out of Destin. Um, we actually have actual architectural renderings. It's, it's, this is not, sometimes my understanding is you'll, you'll see pretty pictures, but that's not how it is because the architectural renderings do not support those pictures. Mm -hmm. These are actually architecturally designed and completed. And so um, once we, we also purchased the Trader John's uh, building that is being renovated right now. Mm -hmm. And so 
when that building is complete and leased up, that's when we can start this project. Uh, obviously, the, the land development code will not allow us to uh, uh, to do this without the the restaurant taking place. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Gerald. Thank you, Mr. President. And I have to say that I agree with Mr. Townsend on this and that it unclutters the sidewalk and allows pedestrians the opportunity to walk freely. But this is a nice rendition of what's to come. Thank, thank you very you. much. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Carroll. Appreciate it. There's no other discussion or comments. Please vote. Oops, I abstain. Sorry. I, okay. Please vote. Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Okay, that passes uh, seven to one uh, with Mr. Spencer abstaining. Okay, thank you. Item 15B. Item 15B is proposed ordinance number 07 12, an ordinance to be entitled. An ordinance closing, abandoning, and vacating a portion of an easement reserve within the Bayou Boulevard right of way in Pensacola, Escambia County, State of Florida, previously vacated by Ordinance Number 11 02, recorded at OR Book 4884, page 455, repealing clause and providing an effective date. Move the approval. Second. Motion and a second. Please vote. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, resolutions, we've got five of them. Mm -hmm. Item 16A. Item 16A is a resolution 09-12 to be entitled, a resolution authorizing and making revisions and appropriations for the fiscal year ending September 30, 2012, providing for an effective date. Move the approval. Second. <clears throat> Motion, second, please vote. 16B. Item 16B is resolution number 10-12, a resolution to be entitled, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Pensacola, Florida, affirming its support of the mission and goals of the Florida Emerald Coast Clean Cities Coalition. Do to approve. Second. second. The motion, second. Discussion? Please vote. Passes unanimously. 16C. Item 16C is resolution number 11-12, a resolution to be entitled, a resolution of the City of Pensacola supporting the 2012 HUD Choice Neighborhoods grant application by the Area Housing Commission. Move the approval. Second. Motion, second. Discussion? Please vote. Mr. Geralds. And that passes unanimously. 16D. Item 16D is resolution number 12-12, a resolution to be entitled, a resolution authorizing and making revisions and appropriations for the fiscal year ending September 30, 2012, providing for an effective date. Move the approval. Second. Motion and a second. Comments? Please vote. And that passes unanimously. And finally, 16E. Item 16E is resolution number 13-12, a resolution to be entitled, a resolution authorizing and making revisions and appropriations for the fiscal year ending September 30, 2012, providing for an effective date. With the approval. Second. Motion, second, discussion. Please vote. And that passes unanimously. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Under unfinished business, um, uh, I know the clerk's not used to um, doing this, but I'm going to ask her to um, give us a little, little history that goes back at least to February um, with us on uh, the mayor wanting to appoint a designee to represent him on TAC. That's Tourism Advisory Something Council. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, on February 6th, there was an item on your agenda to discuss the TAC appointment. As a courtesy to the mayor, to Mayor Hayward, council appointed him to the committee. It was brought to your attention that he wanted to appoint a designee to attend in his absence. Um, to date, there has not been any decision or action from council regarding that appointment. If you would allow him to appoint a designee, or if that would come back to you, and that's been since February of this year. Okay. 
Uh, Ms. Deweese. Thank you, Mr. President. And I just wanted to share the historical information from last year when I was sitting as president and the decisions that were made and brought forward to council for the council to make a decision as a whole. And when we did the assignments to different uh, boards and such, this was a mayoral seat, but that was when mayor was part of council. And I do recall some members of council being quite upset that that was being suggested. Um, so I, I expressed my concern at, the, at that point in February that a designee of the mayor would not be acceptable when truly this was something that council should be sending one of its members to. Um, and it was a courtesy given to the mayor that uh, he be attending the TAC meetings. Um, so I do not support a designee and would actually like a member of council to be considered for that seat. Okay, Ms. Myers. I do not support sending a designee either, and I agree that a member of council should be appointed to attend those, that meeting, those meetings, or be a part of it. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's, uh, put, let's put something together in the form of a motion, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm to move. Do you want to make it a motion? And I, well, I, I would I'm like not expressing a preference one way or the other on this, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, it is, we, we probably need to have a motion here. Well, um, I'll make a motion that we appoint a member of council. To be a member of the TAC, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Second. And then there's a second. Dr. Pratt and Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I hope that that included that we would have nominees next time and, and vote on it on the next agenda. Is that the sort of the intent yeah, if, there? If it, if it passes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, I won't be supporting the motion tonight. I have no problem let the mayor uh, designate someone to serve on this, uh, this uh, particular board, so I will not be supporting the motion tonight. Thank you. And I, I join you in that, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Townsend. Can you tell me what committee we're talking about first? Tourism, tourism, tourism advisory, tourism administration, tourism administration convention committee. Convention. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I have a little issue that we're voting on it right now because <coughs> I actually don't recall how it was in the past. I, I think the city clerk read that were we are uh, were we nominating someone or we had representation on it, or that the mayor was the mayor of the well, the memo goes back to February 6th yes. of, of, this, of this year, and it was a, a request from the mayor then um, to allow a designee um, to, to be appointed by him in his, in his place. And we didn't take any action on, on that. And so the, the issue has um, um, come up again. And so that satisfy you? Okay. You come? I mean, and it, if, if, we, if, if it's a big concern to you, I guess we could vote to put this off to, to, the, to the next meeting. No. Nope. It's been out there for a while. Oh, it's okay. Okay. All right. Mr. Spencer, then Dr. Pratt. Um, I, have, I have the confidence in the mayor's position, and it doesn't have anything to do with the personality of the current mayor, but and I will not support this motion because I feel that that position um, should have and exercise the authority to make this appointment. Okay. Dr. Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. And I wanted to respond a little to Councilman Townsend's question that sort of set the stage a little bit is that um, there are a few committees out there still that, that are governed by some other legislation or that group has had historically requested the mayor to be the person. But with the new charter, the charter did not give that authority to the mayor to have people on committees. It gave that to the council. And though we have confidence in the mayor, that's not what the charter gave, the power the charter gave him. And that, that is the underlying question here, I think, is in, in, the, in that situation when the, the mayor, not, the name mayor is on some document, is it, does it, where does the charter fall on that question? And so should it be something that we, we try to conform more with the charter or with some other system? Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Wu. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, this is one of those issues I'm really confused and puzzled. Uh, and I would like to, before we take actions, seek a legal opinion on how to proceed. Because it's breaking down, it, to some degree, for or against, and I want to vote basically the way I should vote. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think we all feel that, and so I'd like to get a legal opinion on which body has the right to determine this position, then I'm ready from that point to proceed on. Am I making any sense? Yeah, you, ab ab absolutely, sir. Okay. And uh, um, the attorney has not turned on his light to respond, but uh, Mr. Reynolds um, <laughs> wishes to speak. Oh, yeah, Mr. Townsend. Thank you. That's exactly where I'm coming from, what uh, uh, Councilman Wu, uh, I'm having an issue as to am I violating the charter if I vote for the mayor to be on it, as has been implied here, uh, because I want to follow the charter because that's what dictates our course of action, in my opinion. So uh, you raised the question as to whether we should go back and look at it uh, to ensure that we are not violating, since it appears to be some kind of different opinion. I personally don't have any problem with the mayor serving, but I want to ensure that what we do is follow the intent and the context of, of the charter. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you. Mr. Reynolds? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I think it's important to understand, first of all, that the mayor is currently the appointee. What we are talking about here is in those times when the mayor is not available, who will it be that will represent the mayor as this body's already appointed individual. And I just wanted to make sure that we're being very clear in that regard. We're not talking about the mayor not being the appointee. That has already occurred. Okay, good. Thank, thank, yeah, thank you. Uh, Ms. Deweese? Um, yes, I just wanted to offer further clarification on this. Um, when I sat down with the mayor and had discussion on some of the things that we would be doing to begin to transition to the new form of government um, and had the discussion about this particular one um, and had not considered from the perspective of council the issue that may arise. And when this came to council, we had a lengthy discussion on it um, and some council members were upset that this was not a council seat. So possibly I'd like to offer a friendly amendment here because it is actually, as I understand it, council sending the mayor, appointing the mayor to do this um, and not something that has become the mayor's um, decision. So I'd like to offer an amendment that we appoint a member of council as an alternate to the mayor. When the mayor cannot attend, a member of council will attend because I, I'm not sure of the um, last several meetings since he has been appointed if he's been able to attend them no, he, at no, all he so is, he is not so he's very busy so maybe that will solve this problem so my friendly amendment is that uh, the the motion that miss Myers has made but to add that it would be the alternate to the mayor when he cannot attend second mm -hmm. there's a motion and a second please clear the lights so the the uh, only thing that we can discuss now is the, the amendment uh, from Ms. DeWeese. M Mr. Spencer. Okay, I just want to have clarification. And so <clears throat> what seems inconsistent with me is that then the, the, what I prefer that the mayor knowing that there will be inevitable abstinence. There will be some times he cannot attend. So in those times, I feel that the mayor would want to appoint that person that will be basically sitting in the seat that he would otherwise be in, as opposed to council making that appointment. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gerald? Well, for a minute I thought it was about to be cleared up, but let me ask this question. Uh, foolish me. <laughs> let me ask this question. Does this committee require an elected official to be present, as they do with the TDC, the PEDC, and others? Is, this a, is there a requirement that an elected official participate with that group? 
do you know the answer to that, Madam Clerk? I'm not sure, but I can find out for you. Okay. Because if that's the case, then I think the amendment and, and understanding the mayor's uh, availability from time to time, uh, that he may or may not, that, and of course I was going where with Ms. Uh, DeWeese was headed in terms of an alternate person to, um, to fill that, that, void, that void, but at the same time, uh, if we're having difficulty deciding who's going to do it, I would also like to, um, if possible, if the amendment passes or if we come back to it, to uh, do it on a rotating basis since it doesn't appear that anyone else is going to be consistently available, that it is rotated through council members by numbers all the way down to the <coughs> at-large seats. And that would fill it whenever, you know, you'll know when your term mm -hmm. rolls around. Sure. But versus what we're trying to do, uh, and I thank Mr. Reynolds for clearing it up, at the fact that the mayor is already there and it's apparent that he's not been able to attend, but to, um, it's 727, <laughs> rather than go through this all night. Uh, Mr. Dr. Pratt has the first best idea to do it through nominations, but now that we've talked about it a little bit, I don't think we need to make a decision this evening, but to um, and, consider and where we are right now, and then when we come back next committee of the whole, then we'll be prepared to make a decision. If, if it's been missed all this time, uh, I don't think it'll shut down. If it's missed again between now and the time we've had a chance to consider what direction we need to go in. And well, right now I don't hear, I, I feel a state of unreadiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I sense that too, so I just asked whoever made the motion to perhaps withdraw that and we'll take care of it at the next committee of the whole meeting. Yeah, there's three people that still want to talk to it, but um, I would just urge us to um, wait to our next committee of the whole meeting before we um, actually take the vote, Ms. Ms. Myers. Yes, um, I, I would like to amend the motion to... Well, uh, have well, it, we, we, uh, we can't amend again well, because we've got an amendment before us, oh, as, okay. which is the only thing you can, we can talk to right now. So, uh, well, I'll, I'll withdraw the motion. Okay, so you, you had the main motion then, yeah, and I'll you've withdrawn withdraw that. Okay, thank you, thank you, Ms. Myers. Um, since that's withdrawn, Mr. Johnson, Dr. Wu, do you need to speak? Uh, yes. Okay, Dr. Wu. Uh, I go back to my original statement. Uh, the question seems to be the conundrum, and I don't mean to put the attorney on the spot or ask for a ruling today, but it, under the new charter, I believe from what Councilman Pratt said, the council has responsibility to do committee appointments. If that is true, then whoever serves as the ultimate seems like to me would also come from the council. If that's not the case, if that's not the intent of the charter, we need to know that as well. And in that case, the mayor will make the appointment. But I think one way or the other, uh, um, we're still going through this growing pains. And this is just something we need a clarification on, in my opinion. Thank you. One of the things I'd like for you to think between now in the next committee of the whole is allow the mayor to make the appointment and um, to have it uh, affirmed um, by, by the city council. It's just a thought on my part. But as it is now, I support the mayor having his own des designee. Mr. Johnson? Yeah, I, I do too. I just don't think it's a, a, a big deal. I, I'm not, I haven't heard any red flags. We've got an attorney here, city administrator. We've got uh, yeah, you know, we, we professionals here, and I just don't think that the, this is a huge deal. And if the mayor can't attend, he's already the appointee, and, and if he's going to designate someone to, to, to in his absence, I, I just I don't see what, what you know the big deal here. So I I'll, I'll just wait, and, and maybe we can have this before us at the next committee, the whole. But um, but I, I just really don't see the, the big deal of him uh, 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 appointing a, desig a designee to uh, to attend these if he can't. It, it, I just I'm I'm, I'm somehow. Um, not getting it, but I guess maybe it's going back to the charter and what the charter uh, states. So maybe we'll hear that in full uh, next COW. Thank you. Okay. Um, we don't have a motion before us, we, uh, and, but I still got two people that want to speak. And uh, if there's no objection from council, it'll be Ms. Myers and Mr. Geralds. Well, uh, between now and the committee of the whole, um, 
if uh, it has to be an elected uh, official who attends that meeting, then really the issue is moot in terms of uh, the mayor sending a substitute unless that person is a, an elected official. And so anyway, that's all I have to say. I mean, we can get a legal opinion, I suppose, from our, our attorney on that. Well, I'm sure that's at the top of his list between now and then. Mr. Gerald. Yes, and, and I, I, I will be brief on this, but I think that once the, the, um, the motion had been withdrawn, and uh, I, I want to mention that um, Councilmember DeWeese reminded us frequently on process. And since we're not, we don't understand or we don't know what we're supposed to do, let us stop this right now and allow information to come forth and we know what the procedure is and then with the process that we follow will be appropriate. But the opinions that are flying around now, they're moot, they're dead. The motion has been withdrawn and I would suggest if there's no more unfinished business, we'll move on to new business. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. New business. Seeing none, open forum. Ms. Fires. Um, I just wanted to know if anyone, I, I was going to uh, ask that uh, council invite to Mr. Uh, Alter, is it Alter, uh, who gave the presentation to the CRA to give his presentation to the city council. So since he's already given the presentation to the CRA and we've all heard it, I guess there would be no interest that in inviting him to give it to the city council, but I just wanted to to bring that up just in case, uh, you know, okay. if anybody's interested. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. Um, the posting of Monday's CRA meeting as well as the committee of the whole meeting is, is already available for full video review of that presentation. Great, thank you. Okay, I don't have any cards from the public wishing to, to speak, so if there's nothing else from council, we're adjourned.